Hello, and welcome to episode number 185 of the Savvy Social Podcast. This is a show dedicated to helping passion-led entrepreneurs and business owners learn how to use social media as a tool to grow their business. I'm your host, Andrea Jones, and I'm fiercely committed to helping you understand both the how and the why of social media marketing so that you can create connection, build community, and make your difference in the world. And this podcast is brought to you by our free audio series for social media managers looking to grow their business. If you want to go from solo show to agency, this series is for you because the first step is to raise your rates, okay? You gotta raise your rates so that you can invest in hiring your team. You can invest into learning more skills. You can invest into growing your business. So get that for free at onlinedrea.com slash training. Now, today I'm really excited because we have a special guest, Abby Ash. Ashley on the show. Abby is the CEO of The Virtual Savvy, where she teaches aspiring virtual assistants how to launch and grow their at-home business. She was able to leave her full-time corporate job in just four short months after starting her own virtual business while on maternity leave. Definitely going to ask her about that. Abby leads a community of over 65,000 virtual assistants via her email, newsletter, and Facebook community. She's also appeared in many online publications and podcasts, including NBC News, Smart Passive Income, the Side Hustle Nation podcast, and more. And with that, Abby, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Yes. Okay. I totally missed the maternity leave bit when I was reading this earlier. I definitely want to dive into that because I'm expecting my first right now. Oh, congratulations. Um, Thank you. So talk to me about how this all started. How did you start your business? For sure. So I was, um, I was a stay at home mom actually. And I was, um, had, had kind of left my corporate position and transitioned into nannying. Um, so I was at home with my two year old daughter pregnant with my second. Um, and so, you know, kind of working, um, doing a little bit of nannying, doing a little bit of side hustling and really decided to, do something on my own. I was really, really ready to, to kind of venture out on my own path. So, um, I ended up taking a leave and saying, I'm going to, I'm going to do something, but I didn't know what I tried a couple of different things. Honestly, I, um, went down the path of selling like jeans on eBay. I had like a, a frozen meal service thing and nothing really panned out. And that's when a friend suggested that I look into virtual assistants and, Um, I honestly didn't even know what a virtual assistant was, but I started scouring the internet, looked up what exactly I could do as a virtual assistant and decided this is the path I want to go down. And so I immediately, you know, just started calling myself a virtual assistant, telling the world, um, you know, my first uh, posts were right there on Facebook, just telling friends and family. I had no social media following or anything other than just the people I knew, but just even with my small network was able to get the word out about what I was doing and quickly filled my services to the point that it replaced the income from my full-time corporate job. So, um, you know, it was just a, it, it was kind of a whirlwind experience. I don't know if I would recommend that anybody starts a brand new business while they're on maternity <laughs> leave, you know, or, you know, taking during those last few months. I mean, I was super pregnant going to networking meetings and introducing people, you know, shaking hands over my big belly. But, um, you know, it was awesome. I think there's also like an extra drive that happens when you're pregnant sometimes that you're just like, I can do anything. So (laughs) maybe that was it. I don't know. Maybe it was insanity. But, um, you know, I also knew that I would need help like I was very aware because this was my second child. So I knew kind of how difficult it could be in those first couple months. So I hired a team of subcontractors. And so almost started building a little mini virtual assistant agency from my basement apartment. Um, and so did that and continued to grow that business for another 
two years and then eventually launched an online course to teach other people how to start virtual assistant businesses as well, just because I had so many people asking me like, Abby, how did you do this? So launched that online course back in 2016, um, have gone on just to grow that. And, um, you know, we've had, we have a community of over 70,000 members, 3000 students have gone through our program. Now we have 20 full-time employees. And so it's just kind of grown into this massive operation based off of just the want of like, Hey, I'd like to make some extra cash working from home. So it's been a whirlwind for sure. Yes. I love that business journey and the business growth as well, because, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize how much effort and work goes into it. And you talked about, you know, being big belly pregnant and going to these networking meetings and meeting people and, you know, putting you putting your uh, money where your mouth is. So I think that's really important to emphasize as well. Um, but also getting the support when you need it so that you could take that step back when you needed to and, and you could be able to continue to, to run the business in what capacity you could while raising a family. For sure. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, as you're you're building this business um, and as you're actually, I want to ask a question about virtual assistants because I want to define that for the listeners who may not know. Um, you talked about all of the services that you were doing. Can you let us in a little bit? What is a virtual assistant? What do they do? For sure. So a lot of times small business owners don't have the financial capacity or even the demand and and need for a full-time or even a part-time employee. Um, At the same time, a lot of times, you know, there aren't local employees that can do some of the tasks that are really needed by these startup business owners. And so I feel like most virtual assistants really do cater to a lot of the startup businesses, um, either businesses that are, they might be brick and mortar, but are open to online support. Or of course, there's a lot of, uh, you know, online businesses as well starting every day. And so a virtual assistant will usually start out offering a myriad of services, everything from answering customer service emails to potentially data entry, uh, to maybe like some simple social media scheduling, um, to, you know, blogging. There's a lot of different areas that a virtual assistant could cover. And a lot of times it is really, you know, based off of the need of the the client at that time. And so, um, and the skills that the individual takes, uh, you know, is coming into it with. So for instance, I had a background um, with customer service. And so I was doing a lot of customer service emails when I first started my business. And then as I kept growing, I learned that my skill of writing could be transferred into blogging. So I started really studying copywriting and, and kind of niching down. So it's a great entry point for somebody who maybe eventually wants to become a social media manager or wants to become, you know, an online business manager. A lot of times this is virtual assistants is where people will get their foot in the door to those other paths. Pathways. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I love that this is an option. You really couldn't start anywhere. You don't have to have, you know, a degree in anything or anything like that. You just have to have the skills to be able to do the job that people need you to do. Um, and I look fondly on, you know, hiring my first virtual assistants. And I believe I used your directory one time to oh, find I- a virtual <laughs> assistant. <laughs> So um, there's a lot of opportunity for business owners. So if you're thinking about hiring um, support in any way, sometimes a great first step is a virtual assistant. For sure. Um, Okay. So I want to talk about how you grew your business because I think there's a difference between, you know, growing your business as a a service and then growing a course. And I have a funny feeling social media is involved. You've got this big Facebook group. Um, so talk to me how you how you market your business, specifically the differences between the service base and the course and the yes, programming. For sure. Well, I definitely believe that there's two different um, tracks almost for marketing. Um, I love when people start service-based businesses in the beginning of their journey because I do. I truly believe that service-based businesses are the fastest way to make money online and that you don't need a huge following. Now, social media is definitely involved even in, um, you know, even in service-based business and service-based business marketing, but it's not a requirement to have a huge following. So for instance, um, whenever I talk to a virtual assistant and they're wanting to replace their full-time income, let's say that they're selling a package of, um, you know, 10 hours 
for $30 an hour, that's $300 a month. So if they could get 10 clients to do that really small package, then that could potentially make three grand a month, which maybe replaces their income, you know, depending obviously on their circumstances. These are very blanket uh, examples, but you know, so you don't need to get hundreds of people to say yes. You don't need to get thousands of people to say yes. You need to get 10 people to say yes, right? On a reoccurring basis. And so I love that about uh, about service-based businesses that a lot of times, especially if they have a reoccurring model, that you can replace your income very, very quickly. Now let's pivot that to what an online course looks like, right? Or even uh, a blog or an e-commerce store. With those types of businesses, traditionally, you need a lot of traffic coming to whatever your site is. And so a lot of people to visit some of those people are going to say yes in a small capacity. Maybe it's they're you know subscribing to a podcast or they're uh, opting into your email. And then from those people, you get an even smaller percentage who are going to say yes to whatever your offer is, right? And so, and a lot of times that offer, I mean, it could be a membership, so that's reoccurring. But a lot of times with an online course, it's just a one-time payment. And so while the potential is amazing with online courses, a lot of times it can take some time. So, you know, now I can say, you know, five, six years in, I can say, oh, you know, we've got this many, we've got 25,000 Instagram followers and a Facebook group of 70,000 and a huge following on Pinterest and, you know, a YouTube channel. We didn't have any of that when I first started, right? And I think it's really important to look at these big businesses that are having, you know, uh, six figure course launches or these million dollar plus businesses and be like, okay, Let me go back to the roots and see where they started. And it really started with choosing one social media channel to say, this is going to, I'm going to, I'm going to focus. I'm going to go all in on this channel, optimize it as much as I can before moving on to the next one. um, And feel like I'm really getting good traction here, getting good traffic to my website or to my offers before I move on to the next thing. And so that's what we did at the virtual savvy is we just kind of focused on one thing. And once I felt like it was mostly optimized, I had outsourced a lot of the fulfillment of it then move to another one. So uh, again, like the the difference between let's get a ton of traffic to a website, to an offer, to an email list um, versus let me just build some relationships uh, through social media, through local networking, whatever, and try to get a few people to say yes. I, it's, I, it's very, very different in my opinion, the two different approaches. Um, but I think, I think it also shows the versatility of social media because social media can be a let's grow this massive audience and talk to a ton of people, or it could be like, let's form these really intimate relationships and conversations. Mm -hmm. And the distinction between the two is so important. I'm glad that you highlighted that because especially those, you know, maybe you've been a virtual assistant and now you're going to try to sell um, Pinterest templates, um, you know, like Canva templates or something like that. The strategies for building your virtual assistant business and using social media as a marketing tool are different when you're thinking about the service-based business versus the, you know, product-based business or the business that does need more of that audience. So, so important. Um, I want to talk about your Facebook group as well. You know, you've built that. What what is that process like for you? What are some of the things you learned along the way that worked or didn't work as you're building your community? For sure. That was one of the very first things that I did was Facebook group. That was kind of my first all-in strategy, which is funny because I feel like people like kind of discount Facebook groups now, but I'm like, man, it's, it's such a great source of traffic for us. Um, you know, and it has its its pluses and minuses like any platform. However, um, yeah, when, when I started that, I actually closed down another group that I had. The very first group I ever created was very, it was really general. It had no target audience. It was, I think it was called innovative entrepreneurs. So it was all and any and all entrepreneurs. There was like no vetting process of who I let in. I had no rules and it was just a complete spam fest. Like it was terrible. The first Facebook group that I started. And so I completely just got rid of that one. And once I decided to zero in on training virtual assistants, I started a group called virtual assistant savvies for the virtual savvy is our business name. And so, you know, we, we called them savvies and kind of this whole like 
savvy mentality and people kind of own that word now who are in our community. And, um, you know, a couple of things that helped it grow, I believe, was putting the name of my target audience in the title that might sound simple, but people find Facebook groups a lot by just typing in the search. Um, that's how I find Facebook groups. If I want to go on an RV trip, I will like, you know, type in RV into the search column. And so it's, it really is keyword driven. And so I put the title, uh, of my target audience, what I thought people would be searching for in the title. Um, you know, we, we came up with some really great rules over time. Um, you can see our group rules at the virtual savvy.com slash rules too. So you can like read them if you want some inspiration. Um, and then something that we've done in, in recent years is we, um, integrated a tool called group funnels. Um, and there's a couple different tools like this, but we actually, um, have the option for people to drop their email and our questions when we're asking them questions about entering the group. And so um, it's not a requirement, but if anybody wants like our little freebie, they can drop their email there. And we are actually using a, our Facebook group to be um, a lead generator for emails now as well. And so we literally grow our email list by a hundred people, um, sometimes a hundred people a day, usually like three to 500 people a week, literally just by having a free Facebook Facebook group. So free leads are always nice. <laughs> yes. And the money's in the email list, as they say. Sure. So <laughs> that's what we're all doing here. And I love that you, you know, have evolved that group over time. Simple things, put the name in the title. I mean, it doesn't have to be too complicated. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, where do you spend a lot of your time these days when it comes to social media? So uh, the main platforms that we utilize, uh, you know, at the time of this podcast, at least, um, is Facebook, our Facebook group, primarily, um, don't do a whole lot on like our Facebook page other than just, you know, cross posting. Um, so our Facebook group, uh, Pinterest. So we, um, which, you know, you can go back and forth on whether that's a social platform or a search platform, but we blog and, um, you know, use an organic Pinterest strategy. Um, I also show up on Instagram. I honestly, Instagram for me is just kind of like a connection tool. Um, I feel like we don't get as many new people finding us through Instagram as people who are already in our community following there and just kind of connecting. Um, and so uh, that's what we use Instagram for. And then one of our best, more recent sources for getting new traffic, new people to our blog, new people to see our offers is YouTube. And we've really gone in deep with YouTube with, um, you know, a, a good a good keyword research strategy and posting consistently, um, you know, trying to respond as well as we can to comments there. And so uh, YouTube has actually been one of our more recent, like all in pushes that we've been doing now that kind of these other sources are more systematized and streamlined. We're like, all right, YouTube has been kind of what we've been going at the most lately. Oh, okay. I want to dig into the YouTube. I think YouTube and Pinterest are so similar because they're not quite social, but they're not quite search. <laughs> exactly. They kind of cross over both of them. <laughs> yes. And, you know, especially with YouTube and the power of video, I mean, the, like they just added in YouTube shorts and there's so many things that they're innovating over there. Um, and you mentioned the keyword strategy, you know, what have you found works really well for you and your business when it comes to creating that content? You know, once people land on it, um, how do we encourage them to watch the whole video? How do we encourage them to take action instead of just watching more videos, that sort of thing? For sure. So uh, we have a keyword research strategy. We use a tool called Keywords Everywhere. It's free, and we research. You know what are um, what are keywords that are getting a decently high search volume, but also don't have too much competition, which is really nice. That Keywords Everywhere um, and uh, TubeBuddy. That's another tool. We use both of those tools um, to kind of do our research, and so we can kind of look at what is the search volume and and how how likely would would we be able to, to rank for this video if we were to do it. Um, and so, you know, that takes a while to do some of that keyword research. So honestly, we will batch that a lot of times. Like we'll do a ton of research one time a year and then I will actually batch film only two or three times a year. So literally I'll take two mm. or three days and film all the videos all at once. It's super exhausting, but it's also just really effective because I'm like, 
I just don't, I mean, I'm a mom of two young kids now. Like I just don't have the time to every single week produce a, a, a new video. So we do that ahead of time. Um, so yeah, so we, we do those videos. Um, the, the, the format is very similar for most of them. You know, I do a lot of people always say there's the three types of content, right? That educate, inspire and entertain. Um, I do a lot of education, which I think um, does well on YouTube. Um, and it's just kind of more my teaching, my style, you know, it's like, what am I talking about if I'm not like teaching something? So, um, I teach and try to throw in a little entertainment, just some fun into it as well. And so, um, yeah. And then we obviously just put a lot of calls to action throughout the whole video of, you know, subscribe to the channel and usually one opt-in It's like, we're, we're really pushing those two things, um, for the majority. We've also started, um, simulcasting a weekly live stream. And so that's kind of in addition. So, you know, there's, there's the two type, you have two audiences, especially as you grow, you have the new people coming in that are finding you through those search words. Right. But then you have the people that are like your people, right? Like they're the people who want to consistently be hearing from you. And so, um, I've been going live for years now, every Tuesday in my Facebook group. Um, so we've just started simulcasting that also to YouTube and it's insane. The amount of engagement and new subscribers that we've gotten just from doing, I mean, they're like hour long live streams too, and people will sit and watch it. But I think that watch time has really helped our channel. Um, in addition to like the new people coming through our keywords. So I think that that's a strategy that has really helped us over the past year or so that we've been simulcasting. Oh, an hour long live stream. What do you talk about for an hour? I feel like sometimes I end up running out of content after like 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, well, you can tell just for like the five, you know, the 10 minutes we've been talking that I'm not very good at like being succinct. I talk a lot. <laughs> So it's not too hard. No. So honestly, I literally usually go, I, I start with the intention of it being like a 20 minute in my head. I'm like, this is going to be 20 minutes. This is going to be 20 minutes. And then I talk for an hour. Cause a lot of times people just ask questions and engage and I just hang out and, and let them ask questions. So, you know, normally there's a format to the live stream. A lot of times I'll do interviews. Uh, we've now started even interviewing my team. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my different team members will come on live with me. And so that's fun. So they're getting to know my team. So if they're interacting with them via email, they're like, Oh, I'm talking to Katie. I know Katie, you know, like I said, all around on a live stream. So that's been kind of fun to introduce. Um, you know, I, my, my business is such a personal brand that that can be a lot. Sometimes it's like, I can't physically be everywhere. And so starting to move from like a me to we mentality where I have started introducing my team more so people can not only relate to me, but also see my team members and be like, Oh, they also know what they're talking about and be okay with that. So that's something we've started doing more. So literally like if there's a Tuesday, I can't go live, then my team will just go live for me. And it's great. We get just as much views and just as much interaction when my team goes live, uh, which is really nice. <laughs> oh, okay. I want to talk more about the team, um, especially them like stepping in and, you know, being more of the face of the business. Um, and especially on social media, um, how do you start letting go of the reins when it comes to bringing in team members and talk to us about some of the team members who do help with some of the more public or social media aspects of your business? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I could, I feel like any podcast I do, my team comes up because it's, they're literally like the lifeblood of this business. They're so amazing. And so, um, we, you know, <laughs> delegation isn't easy. Like, I mean, for, especially for the majority of us who bootstrapped our businesses and went in and we were, we were the CEO and also the marketing director and also the janitor and also the copywriter and also the tech person, you know, like we were everything. And so, over time, you know, slowly starting to let those things go. It started off by hiring my first virtual assistant. And then I eventually brought on an online business manager. And so actually marketing and social media was one of the last things I handed off because, you know, I mean, the face of the company. And that was just, it was like my baby. It was like kind of what I controlled for a long time. Um, and that's what came more naturally, like my degrees in marketing, like I, that's what I enjoy doing. And so, um, yeah, that was one of the last things to hand off, but it's amazing because once I started like 
letting go of the reins. First, it started off as like, okay, here's exactly what you do and how you do it. And then like, they would share some ideas. I'm like, okay, yeah, let's try that. And then literally now we're at the point where I'm like, just tell me what to do. Like, I just, like, you know, that you are in this, you strategize, you research this even more than I do. So they'll come up and be like, oh, look at this, like, this new series or look at this carousel post that we did. I'm like, that's amazing. Like I, you know, it's like, guess what we're doing? Oh, great. That sounds awesome. You know? So, um, I think it's like a slow release, you know, like, I don't know if you have like an Instapot, but there's like the slow release that you have to do on the Instapot. I feel like that's been my delegation style is just, like, let me just, let me just slow release and like, let, let people slowly like take more and more and more off my plate to where now I have very specific swim lanes for the business. And it's just, here's what I do. And my team literally does everything else. Like if I'm doing something that's not in one of my swim lanes, then I'm really not, you know, being my best asset to this business. And so I just kind of stay in my swim lanes and let them handle the rest. And it's been magic. (laughs) Yes. I love the slow release too. I think, um, I actually think that's a really good strategy because a lot of times as business owners, when we finally convince ourselves that we're going to outsource something, we want to just be done with it. We're just like, here, take it all. Uh, but there is a strategy to, you know, that slow release of letting go, which is so interesting. Um, okay. So I want to ask a question and about the virtual assistants who are just starting their business yeah. um, or even just any service provider just starting their business. Obviously, you've grown to this point today. But if you were to start over, what social media channel would you focus on and what would you do? Like, What would your, what would your time spent look like on that channel? Oh, such a good question. So I... So service-based, again, like as we mentioned earlier, I think is so relationship-based. I think that um, while it's great to start posting content and maybe start growing an email list, man, nothing beats in the beginning just forming relationships. So I would almost, um, rather than saying just one specific channel, I would almost say like, where do you already naturally kind of gravitate toward, right? Um, Are you like when you're just in your free time, like, are you hanging out on LinkedIn? Are you hanging out in, um, you know, in Facebook groups or on Instagram? And probably those would maybe even like Clubhouse. I know that's um, um, a more... Uh, that that one is, can be really relationship based as well. Um, so kind of where are you already spending some of your time because you already know that platform and you're comfortable. So that's like already knocked down one barrier, right? Like, cause learning a whole new platform plus putting yourself out there, like let's just knock down as many barriers as we can. So pick one that you're already comfortable with for me, like Facebook groups. Like I've just, I don't know, maybe it's cause I'm in my mid thirties and I'm like, still think Facebook is really cool, but I just, I spend time in Facebook groups more than I do in any other channel. So for me, I would probably join other people's Facebook groups, potentially start my own group and, and really just start forming relationships, showing value, showing up, um, you know, maybe posting content, but even more than that, just being really, really helpful. I know I've hired someone before. Um, I literally have hired somebody for my business because I posted a question inside a Facebook group and they responded back with like a three minute long video going through my website and giving me feedback. And do, and I was like, what, what? Like you just over delivered so much. Like, how do I hire you? Literally. And it was that value first mentality, which is something that we teach, you know, over at, uh, over at the virtual savvy. And so, um, that, that is where I would probably start is by just really showing up, showing value inside of Facebook groups for me, but that could be Instagram. That could be LinkedIn. It could be clubhouse, wherever you feel like you can naturally show a lot of value and start to build true relationships with people who are your ideal client. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Oh, I love the relationship piece. I think it's oftentimes the most missed piece when it comes to social media. I mean, social media is supposed to be social, right? So (laughs) it's not about posting the content. Oftentimes it is about like making those connections and building those relationships, which is so key. Um, okay. 
What's next for you in the upcoming year? You know, you really talked about how you double down on YouTube. Pinterest is really well for you. Facebook groups. Are you going to branch out into new territory? TikTok, maybe? Clubhouse? Oh, my goodness. I like (laughs) my team is like, I'm like, I know Reels and TikTok is where it's at. Like these short form, but it's like so hard. I'm like, okay, like, yeah, I will do some, but I like going all in is really, really hard for me because it's just, it's like creativity and time consuming and, you know, all those things. Um, You know, I think for us, we are, we're really like narrow and deep. Like that is kind of has been our mentality. And so um, really we're not planning this year to branch out any wider as far as our social media goes. I know there's some rumblings about like starting to like cross post a little bit more to LinkedIn. So not even coming up with like new strategies, new anything, literally just doing what we're already doing on one more platform, um, which is great for anybody. If you're already doing something consistently, it's like, what's the most like minimum thing I could do to show up on another platform. Cause I think if we just stretch ourselves too thin, then we should, we end up showing up um, poorly in a lot of places instead of really well in one or in a few places. And so um, we just choose to show up really well in a few places. And so for right now, we're going to just keep doubling down on, um, on YouTube, Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram, um, and then maybe start cross posting over <laughs> to LinkedIn. Um, for us, we are always like our existing audience, the people that we already have, what are new things we can offer them, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of times, rather than trying to get out and get new people, it's like, what's our already audience already asking for? So for instance, we're creating a, uh, a SaaS platform, a marketplace for people to hire virtual assistants and freelancers and, you know, social media managers. And so we're creating um, a new platform for people to actually find jobs and be hired and to find VAs. And so um, that's something that's coming up in the next year that we will be releasing. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of been our strategy is a little bit more like narrow and deep and just listening to our audience and giving them what they want. Yes. Beautiful. I love that repositioning to the audience. I do think as, especially as market, like I'm a marketer, we always think about new people, new people, but honestly, it's like nurture your current people and it will grow. Exactly. Um, Okay. Tell us about your freebie. We've got this free training on how to become a booked out virtual assistant. Talk to us about it. For sure. Yeah, that is a free on-demand training. So if anybody is interested in becoming a virtual assistant, uh, if that was something that intrigued you, you can go to the virtualsavvy.com slash BBO. That's for become booked out. So uh, on-demand training will show you how to price, package your services, market, find out what you do have to offer as far as a virtual assistant goes. Um, And I'll mention as well that new platform, maybe virtual assistants isn't for you. We, um, the new hiring platform is called Hello Savvy. And we have a wait list over at hellosavvy.com for anybody who uh, potentially wants to put their social media services um, or any other service-based business on that hiring platform that is there as well. Yes. And I have Hello Savvy bookmarked because I know for the social media managers and agency owners that we mentor, that's going to be such a great resource. Um, you just have so many connections anyways that I think it'll be great. Um, and then where else, where else can we hang out with you online? Yeah, definitely. You can find me over at youtube.com slash Abby Ashley or at instagram.com slash the virtual savvy or in our VA Savvy's virtual assistant Savvy's Facebook group. Perfect. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes. Y'all can find them at onlinedre.com slash 185. And you'll get all of the links to the things we mentioned in this episode. Abby, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. And thank you, dear listener, for listening to our episode this week. It's because of you that we are in the top 100 marketing podcasts in the US and Canada and in the UK and Australia. Make sure you head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave your five-star review. It really helps support the show. I will be back at you next week with another amazing episode. So stay tuned. I'll see you then.